my, uh, my dad was born in 1928 and um, actually was born upstairs at the stores where he was born at. Born and raised upstairs and uh, lived all his life on Western. And, uh, and um, so I guess it's kind of honored him, I guess that's why the, that's what they called him was the mayor of Western Avenue for a lot of years. Spent his whole life on the avenue. And, uh, so 83 years was where he, that was his front yard, backyard, and, and uh, playground, and everything else, you know. And, uh, more feed, actually we sold flour back then, produce, uh, live poultry, uh, live chickens, and so forth. Um, in fact, at our store, if you certain days you can still see where it's been, where the glass actually said said feed and flour on there. So it's kind of neat to see where the um, the paint has been taken off of it, you know. But that was uh, we actually sold feed, sold sold flour, um, bedding plants, and so forth, and uh, of course feed and uh, uh, live chickens was a big thing. Even back when my dad was younger, we used to do a lot of um, live chickens. Um, they, they would actually dress them in the store. Um, we still have a, a scale at the store that we use in the main room. It's like a hanging scale that we used used to use to, to weigh chickens on back when my dad was, was really young. People would come in to get their chickens for the weekend, and uh, he knew what every chicken weighed by the time the day was over. <laughs> because he'd weigh them, he weighed this one, he weighed this one. Oh, grab this one over here, Sam. You know, they always wanted the biggest one, everybody did. And he knew how much each one weighed by the time the day was over, you know, just by, by weighing each one so many times. You know. so I know one time there were 14 feed stores in that tomb. Back when my dad was younger, uh, there used to be a, back behind our store in the alley, we, we had tracks back there, train tracks. And one time there were actual six sets of tracks back there where they would spot cars, uh, train cars. And that's where a lot of these feed stores would come and they would unload chicken grit, they would unload the salt blocks, you know, truckloads. That, that's back then, that's when it, it, that stuff was all used uh, tremendously. I mean, uh, um, everybody in Mattoon had something in their yard chickens and chickens. I mean, I recall as a kid delivering here in town, taking chicken food to people when I was young. I'm not sure who actually bought the building from the Knight Saloon, if it was my, my grandfather. Or, uh, I'm not sure when my, my great granddad died. My dad was 14, so it must be like 1942. He must have passed away. But uh, I don't know who owned the business at the time to, to buy the, uh, but they, uh, the upstairs was, oh, back when it was a saloon, uh, that's my Dad said his grandfather always told him it was just an old bordel, this little cat house. It was, it was a rough area of town. I mean, it was a, that was a rough part of town at one time. Um, knights were notoriously, I can't say bad people, but they were known to, to you know, be rough. Um, so Dad always said when he was a kid that, that uh, if you grew up in Western and didn't have false teeth, you were a sissy. Three guys in town that, um, Dad being one of them, that were, they called him the uh, Matt Toon's Walking Downtown Historians, they called him. Uh, one was Adolph Call, uh, Don, of course, the Call had the, the, uh, the Coke plant at the time, the Coca Cola plant. Um, Don Bohr was one fellow. He was a, uh, Don the Barber, and he was a barber downtown for 100 years, but different locations, you know. Uh, but they just were three guys that if somebody came in and asked Dad something about downtown and he didn't know, he'd call Adolph or call Don. I mean, those three always knew. <laughs> There's no doubt. And they, they would. They would have the answer, but they're all three gone, you know. But, uh, but uh, oh, just to think that the, the changes he's seen on Western himself, you know, um, the changes I've seen. He talked about, um, you know, Walker's dog being there. Um, I remember that the night they had the, uh, the Walker's fire, um, you know, that's leveled all that, that whole walk was gone. Alexander's was there for a lot of years with Alexander's office equipment. Um, actually, Lakeland College started upstairs. Is one of the places they started. Uh, you had wool furniture there for a lot of years. I um, um, always had a barber on Western Avenue all my life until probably five or six years ago or so. He was cool. I'll just use the word cool because he was. <laughs> I mean, even back when he was older, you know, younger guys, would, uh, younger children would, would say, "Your dad's cool." You know, I mean, he was he was a neat guy. You know, but uh, oh, he just he knew everybody. I mean, he was uh, new people. You know. A few years ago, we were, we were identified as the smallest Jewish congregation in North America by <laughs> Reform Judaism magazine, and someone from the Chicago Tribune came down and filmed us 
during uh, wrote an article. and wrote, and um, as a result of that article, which appeared in the Chicago Tribune, there was an uh, old timer from Mattoon who called me up. He was retired in Florida, and he called me and he told me all about what it was like to grow up Jewish in Mattoon when he was a kid. And he said it was just great. The community was so, the community at large was so proud of their Jewish community. Um, Jews owned businesses. It was, um, they all knew one another. They had, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful place to grow up as a Jewish kid. And that strikes me as, as a beautiful thing about the community. And one of the members with whom I had some contact online um, mentioned that the youth group during the 1960s actually won an award. They only had eight members and they won an award as the best um, reform associated, reform Jewish associated youth group in the late 1960s. So we know that there was really committed involvement here. It goes back to the 19th century and that's around the 1850s and the train. The fact that there was a a train and people could come here from more industrialized cities. It really pretty much started as a mercantile community and Mattoon has had more of the mercantile community um, than Charleston and Coles County. So this became the place where the Jewish community lived. The um, Mattoon Jewish Community Center started with a fairly huge Jewish community. Um, in the 1940s, in the, the late 19, yeah. 1940s. And then at a certain point, it was so much a part of the community that they would have roast beef dinners. And in corn beef. Corn beef dinners, that's right, corn beef dinners. And um, in the building that was given to the Jewish Community Center on um, Richmond Avenue, where um, we had services until just a couple of years ago. It was our place of worship, or what the Yiddish word would be shul, um, or synagogue. When, and so our synagogue was 1601 Richmond Avenue for many years until 2008. Mattoon was considered the greatest placement because our participation um, for a long time was close to 100%. The whole Jewish community would show up for our services, um, not just High Holy Days. High Holy Days, we often had family come, so High Holy Days were, were quite active. And this was about 20 to 30 families during the 1990s. And a lot of children. And we had, we had a yearly bar or bat mitzvah for beginning in 1997 through about 2002. It was, it was remarkable, and our kids have grown up with a Jewish identity. And um, my children are now living in cities, um, Los Angeles and Boston, and they have a Jewish identity. They, um, they understand how to fit into, the, into any Jewish community. So we feel very proud of that. Even though we, we are tiny and we worship in a church and we have you know three or four families sometimes two or three families at services we're we're still part of the larger world I was invited to a meeting in 2006 that was hosted by the Lumpkin Family Foundation and a number of other community leaders were there and the Lumpkin family is uh, spread out throughout the United States and there's some family members that live in Philadelphia and Philadelphia has the largest uh, mural arts program in the world and so the Lumpkin family was suggesting this program for Matt Toon. Through a series of about eight meetings and probably about 150 different people coming in and out of those meetings we made a number of decisions and, and hired a, an artist first artist we hired uh, for the first mural was a man named Dave Gordon and he came out and we started the actual design process where he took all of our thoughts and suggestions and ideas, met with the group a couple times, went back to California, created a, 
created a, a couple of possibilities, came back and met with the committee, and the committee selected one and started the ball rolling. He was in Mattoon by the 1st of September of 08, uh, painted for a couple months directly on the wall, and uh, when the weather got bad, went back home to, to do some other projects and came back in the spring and we finished up the mural in August. The title of it is Civility. And when you look at the mural, you see that it's, it's a cornucopia of things, which from what I've learned now is typical for a community's first mural. It's hard to narrow down on just one theme because so many people want so many different things in it. But you know, Dave was prepared for that and I think it's turned out very well. It, it's multi-generational, it has uh, you know, some different times of history represented on there, all the way from the present to uh, the inception of Mattoon, the lone elm tree is represented, the, the original train crossing in downtown Mattoon. There's a lot of, uh, of different things there. It's, the mural's lit at night, it looks, it's just amazing to have something like that in this town. So that was a success, and we went on to a second mural, and during the first mural, our community meetings were based with anybody who wanted to be involved, but all we had were adults. There were no children involved, and so we decided let's do the same com community process, but limit it to school children. So I think we started with age 10 and up, and they selected the, the young man that we hired, a, a fellow named John Lidecker, who had just finished the second largest mural in the United States before he came here. Every, every person that's depicted on that mural is somebody from Mattoon. Uh, some of them we, uh, we invited people in to do a little photo shoot for John to have his reference photos and others. We just went to the schools and to the ballparks and to the playgrounds and took pictures of kids and got releases from their parents and, and have put them into the background images. Um, the city has just finished uh, taking care of the old thrifty building wall that's uh, adjacent to the depot parking lot. Uh, they just finished it up in early December with a coat. And uh, so I've already started talking with the Lumpkin Family uh, Foundation and we will probably start a process uh, late in 2015, hopefully to get a mural up there in 2016. But that's the next plan and that'll be another you know, 4,000 square foot plus mural, so it'll be a large one. It brightens up the area. It just uh, it, it adds another another layer of community. My grandfather moved here to Mattoon when he was two years old and started buying ground when he was 20. And we've continued to purchase property uh, in and around the farm that we farm there in the northwest part of the county and have uh, corn and soybeans has been very, very good to my family. Well, as Abraham Lincoln, as he marched this circuit, you know, rode this circuit, and he was over working in Terre Haute, and then he had to go to St. Louis on his horse. And he commented that it was uphill all the way to Coles County, and then downhill all the way to St. Louis. So what happened here in that glacier event, now don't ask me when that happened, because that's been a while, but when that last glacier melted here, it came as this far south, about as far south as Route 16, and then it melted. So the water had to go somewhere, so it, it went downhill towards the Ohio and towards the Mississippi River. So what we have here, and right here in Mattoon, we're on a moraine. So part of my farms drained to the Ohio River, part of them drained in the Mississippi. So we have multiple outlets for our water, which is very vital to farming, getting the water away. So we're as far south as the good ground goes, and we're still in the black ground, and we've got multiple outlets for our water, and that's what makes Mattoon great. And we've got such good markets like Decatur and access to the river, so we can get down to New Orleans and export our product. I mean, you know, great roads, got the Interstate 57, you know, a long, firm, well-established tax base that's, you know, allowed us to build good roads, good schools. So, we're just sitting here in the, the best place, one of the best places to farm. I want to tell a story about Confederate operatives that were 
uh, working in the northern states and for a brief period of time here in Mattoon, and it's a very rare and local piece of Civil War history. In January of 1864, the Confederacy, the powers that be, in Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy, they realized that the war was not going well. Um, they were on the defensive, they were low on supplies and manpower. Union blockades had severely damaged their economy. It was becoming increasingly clear that the European countries, which they had hoped would ally with their cause, were probably not going to do so. So it wasn't going well, and so President, Confederate President Jefferson Davis and Secretary of War James Snedden they decided that they would launch a covert operation, which would be insurrection and subversion and it would be sabotage. And they wanted to do this in the northern states because they were hoping to divert northern attention and manpower from the southern states to the north. And they chose as their military leader of the operation a young man named Captain Thomas Henry Hines. Hines went to, in April of 64, 1864, he went to Toronto, Canada. Now in Canada, there were a lot of ex-Confederates, not ex-Confederate soldiers, but ex-Confederate POWs who had escaped and had gone into Canada for refuge. And there were a lot of Copperheads, which most people will know, Copperheads were Northern people who sympathized in some manner with the South. So there were a number of exiled Copperheads there as well. And he was in Toronto, which was somewhat of a hub for agents doing the kind of work he was doing. And so he was there to create a force of operatives to run his plan. So in June, Hines met with leaders of the Copperhead movement that were exiled in Canada. And what they did is they promised that they would offer him volunteer Copperhead volunteers, paramilitary groups that would help him with his plans. So Hines devised a plan, and the idea was uh, that they were going to break out prisoners in Camp Douglas, which was a Union prisoner of war camp and housed Confederate prisoners. And they were hoping to break them out. They also hoped to break out prisoners in the Rock Island barracks in Rock Island. And they were going to take these soldiers, along with paramilitary groups that belonged to Copperhead organizations, and they were going to form a Confederate Army of the North. So Hines intended to execute this plan. He had the promises of the leaders of the Copperhead groups in Chicago, in and around Chicago, and in Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. They also hoped to overthrow the, the governments in those three states. They had a plan to simultaneously do this while they were breaking these prisoners out. So on August 28th, he gets together with one of the leaders of the Copperheads. It's a gentleman named Charles Walsh and he was the political boss in Cook County, and he had promised Hines 5,000 armed men. Well, it quickly became obvious that he was not gonna be able to come up with 5,000 armed men. So Hines said, you know, kind of like, can you give me 500? And they couldn't come up with 500 because Hines thought he'd still be able to break some prisoners out. And they said no, and he said, well, what about 200? So Walsh said he thought he could get 200 men. He leaves and comes back shortly after and comes back with 25 men. So obviously that wasn't going to work. And this is where his story intersects with Matt Toon. John Castleman and about half the operatives went to Marshall, Illinois. The National Road goes through there. So it made, gave them easy access to metropolitan areas so they could sabotage things along the way and in those metropolitan areas. And Hines and his operatives came to Mattoon. The two major railroads intersected there here in Mattoon. It made them easy to sort of like hop a train and go sabotage something and come back. What they also did is Mattoon had a number of Union warehouses that were fully stocked and not very well secured. And so they burned a lot of these warehouses here. And then they, you know, Hines ran his operation for the month of September 1864 here in Mattoon, Illinois. And um, what happened to this group then finally is, I guess it's an old story, but one of their members, a gentleman named John Mahan, was in one of the saloons on Broadway or Western Avenue drinking. And he starts bragging about burning these Union warehouses along with Captain Hines. And so he gets arrested. And Hines, when he finds out Mahan has been arrested, he barely gets away. The military police are chasing him and his operatives, so he barely gets away. But also what happened is Mahan also told of a plan they were going to meet with Copperhead leaders in Sullivan, Indiana. 
Hines went on then, he had to go back to Chicago. They had planned to, on election day, November 8th, they had planned to try this revolt again in Chicago. And he actually intended to, I guess, make it a little bit larger this time. He was gonna have people burn small villages and towns in Northern Illinois. He also had a plan to have his operatives burn New York City, Boston, and Cincinnati. So another important aspect of this story is that these Confederate operatives, they really were the predecessors of what was, what became the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, that was created by the U.S. during World War II for, as, intelli as an intelligence group. And that in turn became the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, which obviously still is in operation today. So some of these agents, some of these predecessors of these organizations were working on a map too, here for a month in September 1864. Camp New Hope is currently a year-round recreational experience for the developmentally disabled. It's a light-up experience. I said a lot of these kids cannot speak, but we know they're having a great time at camp. Their eyes sparkle, uh, their little faces get red, their little eyes light up into joy. It's one of the best experiences I think that they can have. Also, I believe that even more so, the people that come out and work at camp or volunteer at camp, I hear the same story and I see it when they come out, how much of a satisfying experience it was for them as much as it was for the camper. The first group that had something to do with uh, starting all of this was a group of seven families. What they had in common was that they all had a child of their own that had severe disabilities and were uh, in need of services. And some of the ideas that came about from that, um, uh, many of the parents um, had the need for caregivers. So we, we kind of, that kind of led us in the direction of wanting to make camp an all year round camp. We've added in the last few years, um, or updated, our uh, amenities that we offer. Uh, we have a new arts and crafts center. We also have a new miniature golf center that with the help of a special volunteer of camp, Billy Ballou, um, received donations for that and a new center was opened two years ago. Um, last year we opened a new activity center which is a indoor recreational center so that when there's inclement weather um, or too hot, too cold, um, they can come inside and, and do their activities indoors. We were really quite proud of how the facility turned out. We wanted a homey feeling. We wanted it to be beautiful, warm, uh, cozy, that our loved ones would feel right at home, but yet still have that camp feeling. And um, I think with the decor of the building, we were able to accomplish this. And I hear often that after camp, they look forward to Christmas, but as soon as Christmas is over, it's camp on their brain. When am I going to camp? When am I going to Camp New Hope? Um, it's that much of a, a highlight for their year. Some wonderful stories being shared with you tonight, and we've got some people to thank as well. We sure do, thank you. Thank you to Mark, Holly, Sharon, Marianne, and Lindsay, who used to work here at WIU. Hi, Lindsay, <laughs> and your family, and Carrie. So I think that's, that about does it, and you guys are awesome. And what number are we up to? We are at 46. All right, we didn't quite meet that goal of 50 when we were going into the uh, show earlier, but you can make that goal right now, it, and we want to up it. We want to make the number 60 during this break, at we, least. I know we can do it, but it's going to take every one of you to do it. That's right. And oh, there there's one right there. And we celebrate those yeah, phone yeah. calls with the Mattoon Bell. Did you say that that's what's used at the high schools or? Yeah, here, here. the Mattoon Green Wave Bell right there. We're ringing that and here we get so excited when you call because we know, I know, can you see it? Because we know you are showing your support for WEIU, your local public broadcasting station bringing you the stories from Matt Toon. That's right. 
So we will ring this bell every time you call. So right now, who's going to be next? We need to get up to our 60 goal. Uh -huh. And right now, we need somebody to make the phone ring. We've got seven operators that are free right now. So give us a call. If you're enjoying the program that you're watching, it's, it's great if you want to support program like this. And it's only you that's going to make the difference here tonight by picking up the phone, calling. Your cell phone is sitting right there beside you watching the program. So you don't even have to get up out of your seat. Just give us a call right there. Push the numbers on your, on your phone there. Give us a call and uh, get a great set of those DVDs. For $75, you're going to get two DVDs with 32 stories shared by Matt Toon People. Where else can you get that? Well, you're not going to get it anywhere else because the public broadcasting television station is the only way you're going to get that. Uh, we didn't go into the town and ask people to pick, do certain stories. We let them choose the stories. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did they want the world to know about Matt Toon? And the people of Matt Toon stepped up to the plate and they did an awesome job. So right now, those of you who are watching, if you love it, give us a call. And you can get a discount if you get two sets sure. of DVDs. Maybe you want to give it away as a gift. Maybe you want to hold on to it and give it away for a birthday. Um, Easter's coming up. Mother's Day's coming up. Great gifts to give family, friends, you name it. Well, when I think of giving it as a gift, I think about somebody's a mother or their father. What do you get them? I mean, what do you get them for Christmas or birthdays or Mother's Day? This is something that they will treasure forever. So, you know, think about that as you're, as you're thinking about the holidays coming up. Uh, we would love to be able to send that to you. And we want you to keep those phones ringing. Come They're on. busy right now. We still have a few open. We're going to shoot it over to the other side of the studio. Lori's going to tell you a little bit more about what Andy Trueblood has to say. Please. All right. Well, as you said, I'm here with Andy. You're one of the over 30 storytellers that we had for this program. What motivated you to say, hey, I want to be part of Mattoon. This is our story. Well, I just, I guess from a country point, point of view, I just want to bring my story to that format, which is a little different than the stories we've got going on here. Yeah. So um, the things I remember growing up in the country, we had no technology. <laughs> Not like we do today. <laughs> no. So um, if we wanted to watch something, we usually watch Channel 17 News if we could get it in by rotating the antenna through the window. <laughs> um, so when we came to Mattoon, it was, um, it was a big city to us. It was uh, always a good time. There was a lot of things going on and, and um, it was different. We had a lot of fun coming to town. Mm -hmm. So I very much enjoyed coming in and seeing all the different things. And I just, I've been here my whole life. Yeah, and so. your story is coming up in this next segment. So you're gonna see it and we have the preview. Everybody loved your story and the way that you told it. Just a lot of neat memories. I, you talk about this, we don't wanna give it all away, but there's a reference to the Sally Ann Bakery, which I know my father-in-law to be has shared a story about the Sally Ann Bakery with me. And so I think people are going to recognize those places and it's gonna resonate with them as well. Yeah, I remember uh, also Broadway being such a, a cool place and uh, and it did. Uh, it's actually got a lot of history. A lot of things happened on Broadway. There's, a, there's actually a lot of beauty in the architecture in Broadway. So I, I just enjoy that as I, as I travel through. Yeah, and a lot of that beauty and excitement is coming back to downtown as we've seen with the Miro Project and the Depot and yeah. the Arts Council. And so it's kind of downtown is sort of getting a new life again, which is exciting, I think. It is very exciting because um, I, I would love to see Mattoon grow more and more uh, I, I think it's got great potential. It does, and it's got great people. Many of them who have called and become members of WEIU tonight have supported the station that made this program possible and support their town. So I'm gonna send it over to Jeff Owens with the Mattoon Bell. He'd love to ring that every time there's a phone. Yes. Talking to Carolyn Cloyd from the United Way. Her, her story just aired, but she actually had a neat story when she was answering the phone tonight. So. Carolyn, talk about the phone call you just got. Well, I was just talking to a very nice lady who, unfortunately, she missed uh, getting in on the storytelling. She really wanted to talk about Howell Asphalt and what Howell Asphalt has done in the community and all the great people that have worked at Howell Asphalt. So, unfortunately, like I say, she missed that story. But um, before she hung up, she said she thought this was one of the best programs, one of the best things WEIU had ever done, and to keep up the good work. <laughs> great. Now, you're from, you're, you live in Mattoon. Tell us about what you think is the best thing about Mattoon. I think just the community and, um, you know, by that I mean people. 
it's it's really special living in a small town where you know people and everybody knows you know different things but history is about people so I think it's very important that we we do this story I think it's great the history is great we've got great business support from the community great storytellers great people it's a great town to live in we just need you to call right now and continue to get these phones ringing here's Jana with more information thank you Jeff and uh, Carolyn we really appreciate that the comment that came in that's a great comment you know where else are you gonna get a program like this being on Matt Tune, who else is going to do it if your public broadcasting uh, station doesn't? I'd like to give a shout out and a thank you to Tanya, Joanne, Janice, and Jim. Thank you so much. Each one of you, you know, you, you did your part. You picked up the phone and you called and you gave to the, your station that is providing a program like Matt Tune, This Is Our Story. The phones are really quiet, as you can see right now. There's no one on the phone except for one person. So right now, I'd love to get seven more people to call. Right now, we just need you to get on the phone and call and support this great program on Matt Tune. I'm going to throw it back over to Lori and see what she has to say. All right. Thank you, Jano. I'm sitting here talking with Andy, reminiscing about Matt Tune. I think one of the things that's interesting, somebody told me this, that Matt Tune's population has stayed fairly the same for many, many, many years. Did you know that? I did not know that. No. Uh, I'm learning all sorts of things about Mattoon that I did not know tonight, and I think a lot of other people are too. I would think so, because I've not seen the entire segment yet, the entire show, so I, I know I've learned things already on what I've seen that yeah. I did not know. You are too young, but I, a story that's coming up that a lot of people about Mattoon know about is the Mad Gasser. I am not too young <laughs> for that. I asked my uh, father-in-law to be, well, do you remember that story? Because he would have been six and he said, oh my gosh, yes. My mother was like, lock the doors, lock the windows. It, it created a lot of people were very afraid. I mean, what do you remember hearing about it? I don't remember when it was. Yeah, it was I like just 45. remember talking yeah. about it, uh -huh. uh, people talking about it, but I never ever knew what it was about. Well, I never knew. You're going to hear, hear the whole story tonight, so you're going to want to stay tuned. Still to come, we've got a great story about St. Mary's School, the Mad Gasser, Lightworks and Bagel Fest, and Andy's story, the memory of Country Boy coming to town. I was a country kid who got to come to town, and I remember it was a big deal. And we're going to hear an Andy's story of how it was a big deal to come to Matt Tune. So we'll send it back over to the ladies. Some great local stories. I love I it. I love it too. And I also love it that we are at number 52. Mm -hmm. We have Catherine and Anita who have both called in. Thank you so much for your support. Every call count, counts. Uh, we got a call at somebody that did support the program and she said she worked on the first Babe Ruth um, in Mattoon in 1969. And she said all the stories tonight wow. are bringing back so many memories. If you're one of those people out there right now that you're saying the the uh, stories are amazing and it makes me remember the good old days. Mm -hmm. If you're one of those people right now, call us please and support this program. Yeah, all of the storytellers and just the people of Mattoon have really mm -hmm. made me feel like a part of your community. Mm -hmm. Working here at WEIU is such a joy and such a pleasure because we get this opportunity mm -hmm. to meet you face to face. And we also get the opportunity to hear from you by you picking mm -hmm. up the phone, calling the number at the bottom of your screen right now, and receiving one of those great thank you gifts for becoming a member of WEIU tonight and supporting the efforts of your local public broadcasting station. So don't wait, pick up the phone, give us a call right now, and let's hear more about some of those local stories. Yeah, we'd love for you to call and talk to the operator. One of us will talk to you. We'd love for you to call right now. Uh, we don't want to, we want you to look at the number and we want you to call. And you know what, some of the things that may resonate with mm -hmm. you is like people. Mm -hmm. People like the mayor from Western Avenue that we heard mm -hmm. about. We've got some more people coming up, like Andy's story is coming up. We're going to hear about the creepy little mad gasser <laughs> that is a great from back story. in the day. And St. Mary's School and Lightworks and Bagel Fest. So don't go away, keep those phones ringing, and stay tuned. Father Manigan decided that the boys of the church needed some religious education along with subject matter. So he started teaching in the back of the church and then it grew. So he began to use his own funds to build the first school called St. Anne's Academy. Population grew. Um, it switched hands through a couple of priests and they decided to build another school at 1900 in Richmond. Um, I believe this is where the girls came in because it was just an all boys school. It was very popular throughout the church and our parish and the community. 
um, enlisted Catholics and non-Catholics. And then um, it eventually went through Father Daly, who he made it into St. Thomas. He broke ground for where the school is now. And he actually started a carnival, which brought in the community of Mattoon. And it was a three-day carnival. They, they auctioned off a Dodge Diplomat, which today is still part, we call it the Knights of Columbus Picnic. Uh, it's still part of our church. Uh, we bring in the community, and Casey Summers donates a car every year, a truck usually, a red one. Father Niebergy took over, and I actually entered the school in 1989, and he started in, I believe it was 1979. Um, and the name had changed somewhere in between there to St. Mary's. And it still went through eighth grade. I believe my entire family actually went to St. Mary's school. The nuns kind of dwindled out due to retirement and illness, but he did bring a few sisters from Notre Dame down and they taught there at the school for several years. St. Mary's actually got so big at one point they built a new school on South 9th. And then when the nuns start, began to pull out, they had to close that school down. Um, Lakeland College bought it and used it as a physical education and music classes, and then it is now Broadway Christian Church. Today the school goes through fifth grade because middle school begins from fifth to eighth and the church feels that it's good to intermingle before high school with, you know, the public kids. But they, we do sports, so a lot of the kids already know a lot of the public kids, so it's not anything, they're not jumping into like cold water, you know? <laughs> they're, they feel welcome there too. We have preschool, three and four year old classes. We have music and basketball. It's co-ed, boys and girls. In the mornings, we say prayer and pledge. It brings the school together. I know a lot of schools don't say the pledge anymore, um, but we all hold hands in a giant circle and it just starts the day off. It brings us together. Not everybody has to be part of the church, but it, it helps kids learn about how to be a better community member, how to live the best way possible, and they get a really good education. I know when I went into junior high, I had no problems. The grade scale was a little harder at St. Mary's, so it was a breeze when I got to junior high. I know a lot of people say that, you know, it's a private school, it probably won't last long or anything, but that's not true. It's been around since 1863, so I think it'll be here for a long time. I think it takes the back of the parish um, to, to back us and to stand with us. It also takes our, the community because St. Mary's has been around for a long time, but it doesn't have to be just because you're a Catholic, you can only go there. Um, it takes people to realize that it's a great school for your children to go to and they get a great education. Um, it takes support from the teachers and you know teamwork. And it takes the students to really be involved with the school. Oh, the Mad Gasser, Matt Toon. It is, um, it's one of the great unsolved mysteries of Matt Toon, Illinois, probably, period. Um, really, maybe nationwide. Um, the story goes back in 1944, um, from August 31st into September 13th. There were 21 reported cases of an assailant, an unknown assailant, entering individuals' homes, spraying them with some type of gas, whether it be ether gas, um, nobody really knows what kind of gas was used. And individuals would report anywhere from being nauseous to dizzy um, to being paralyzed. Um, why these attacks were happening, we don't know. We don't know who the individual is responsible for these attacks, even though there's some speculation of who or what may have been involved. Um, but the first such attack, reported attack, happened on the evening of August 31st in 1944. Um, an individual named Urban Rayef um, reported a kind of a foul-smelling, strange odor um, in the house um, and reported that he was becoming dizzy and nauseous um, when his wife, Mrs. Rayef, tried to get out of bed to go see if it could have been something maybe from the stove she was paralyzed and could not move. The largest report came um, a few days later um, when a woman named Mrs. Kearney um, on um, September 1st, um, her and her daughter um, became the first reported attacks to the media. Um, and it's oftentimes 
referred to as the first actual attack, but it was really the first one that the media got a hold of, and then it became the media sensation. Um, they too experienced similar symptoms, dizziness, nausea, um, perilous, Ms. Kearney's um, legs went numb, and they're also the ones that claim to have been given a description of the individual, um, who was a tall individual, um, thin individual wearing dark colors um, and a dark, tight-fitting stocking cap. Kind of almost like you would see a lot of burglars and perpetrators back in the 1940s, a very similar description of those individuals. The last reported case was a woman by the name of Bertha Birch. Um, she was the last person to report this. Um, what's interesting about Ms. Birch's report is she claimed that it was a woman dressed like a man. And there were high heel foot you know, shoe prints out in the yard outside of her house. But nevertheless, this has created a lot of, a lot of panic in Mattoon. Um, citizens really started to patrol neighborhoods um, with guns and so forth. Um, that is starting to alert the local authorities. Um, the FBI was even notified of these strange incidents involving gassings, home invasions, and so forth. We never find a perpetrator. There is no physical evidence that anybody was gassed, um, that anybody was physically assaulted. So the whole question now is what caused these particular you know, instances? Um, there's been a few explanations over the years. An individual named Farley Llewellyn Farley Llewellyn was a Mattoon native. He was a chemistry student at the University of Illinois. And Farley was, how to describe him, he was described as being a loner and he had a drinking problem as well. Um, it's also reported that Farley had a secret chemical lab in his home and that Farley could have possibly been the mad gasser. Um, why he would have been gassing these certain individuals, it's not really clear. Um, an interesting fact is that many of the early victims just happen to be people that he graduated high school with. The most commonly accepted theory is mass hysteria. Um, why was one attack reported? Um, we really don't know, but we get one attack, another attack, soon we have 21 different reports of attacks, then we have a community that's panicking. Um, and that's really what has been decided that it was largely mass hysteria. Um, the American Psychological Association determined that it was pretty much a prime candidate for an episode of mass hysteria. And what's really interesting about that, there's only been two local events that has reported that degree of mass hysteria, the Mad Gasser and the Salem Witch Trials. New York Times was writing about it. I mean, it was coast to coast. It, it was in um, the Star Spangled Banner, which is the, the military um, newspaper. It somehow it got in there. So it went national. A lot of local people think that somebody was attacking them. Uh, there's a report from the Time Magazine uh, reporter came down, I think like three years later, and interviewed a bunch of people, and he basically reported that it was the perfect case of mass hysteria, um, and that's how they reported it. Uh, there's other people who've written stuff about it, uh, not fictionalized books, but like nonfiction books or what their theories are. Scott Maruna is one of them, um, who's a Mattoon, uh, Mattoonite, I guess. And he blames, he has, you know, has people that he thinks were involved and stuff like that. But really, I just, you don't know. Um, I mean, I was just going straight from every report I could find from all the newspaper reports, from anybody who wrote nonfiction about it or anybody who wrote a book about it. I tried to read everything and incorporate everything into my book. It's just a local tell that um, I've heard when I was working at the newspaper. Uh, and I think the most interesting thing is that it's just unsolved and nobody knows what happened. So um, I wanted to try to tell a tell on what I thought happened, including all the information I could find about it. I think the Mad Gasser of Matt Toon has alliteration and assonance, um, so it makes it sound better. And I think that's why it caught on more. But in the newspaper, the first bigger headline had anesthetic prowler 
Um, and I just that one just doesn't roll off your tongue as much. So I think the Mad Gasser, Mad Toon, since the, the language of it, uh, made it the one that stunk the most. And the Journal Gazette, which was the Mad Toon paper, it was just kind of reported as facts and what things happened. Other newspapers were making light of some of it, especially at the end of it when it was happening, at the last week of it. Um, but most of it was just reporting as if it, the things that were happening were happening um, and that, you know, the police were checking out every call and everything that was uh, reported it, and then the newspaper would pick it up and report it as well. Most of them were reporting that they were getting nauseous, that they were having burning lips and um, some of them couldn't breathe as well. Uh, but mainly it was everything related to anxiety. So um, some breathing problems, nausea, some people even vomited, um, some a woman reported that you know somebody ran through their house. Um, and other people had saw people, um, had seen people outside, but there was never ever anyone caught or anything like that. Most of them were around a, probably a six or seven block of you know Broadway around town and there, uh, and a lot of them were on Dewitt Street, and then uh, what's the one over? But mainly down there, uh, all. That's why a, a lot of people was blaming uh, some of the industries in town for having some kind of gas that was blowing in and making people sick. Um, and then the first few attacks were in the area where they thought that would happen. Uh, but then they started happening other places as well. I think the one that probably got the most attention is the first attack, the Eileen Carney attack, because it was the first. Uh, then the second one was probably uh, the Cordes attack where uh, Bueller Cordes thought that she had found well, she found a rag that was on her porch and she sniffed it and thought it had some kind of gas on it and she got sick and they called the police and everything like that. And then they took that cloth to Springfield and did tests on it but found it didn't have anything in it. The city of Mattoon has a long history of street fairs, festivals, community events, even back into uh, the late 1800s. There were a, a group that really got together and decided they were gonna be the first festival group in, um, in Illinois. So it really, we have a long history that, that it kind of makes sense now that you, when you look at the other events that we do. And so uh, there were extraordinary efforts made for pe bringing people in and there were booths up and down Broadway and even very close to where we have a lot of our parades now. And there were, you know, two and three story towers made so speakers could be heard. And, you know, this real um, commitment to community kind of started early. So it's, it's interesting that now that we have come, you know, so far with other things that it really has basis in history. We are about to enter the 30th year of Bagel Fest. Um, the end of this year will enter into the 24th year of Lightworks. And I think somewhere around the time that, that these became, um, started, there were people who were looking for things for the community to work on together. Um, the Bagel Fest actually is, a, is one of my favorite stories in Mattoon. Uh, Murray Linder came to town with this, this bagel factory and in the 80s bagels were not a common Midwestern staple in a kitchen. So we had this enormous bagel breakfast to introduce this idea to uh, both the people who were going to be working for him and the people who were going to be consuming his product. Um, community leaders were looking for a festival, something to hook into at that time, something that would be a signature part of the community. And so this, this sort of fell into their lap in a way and they took that idea of hospitality um, and brought it into the idea of a festival. And it has changed um, year to year. It's not always been the same for 30 years, but there's a real sense of continuity when it comes to people getting together and people volunteering our hours. And, you know, it's been downtown, now it's in Peterson Park. One of the, my favorite parts of Bagel Fest happens on Saturday morning right before what is still a free bagel breakfast in DeMar Center. There are there are chairs that start showing up all up and down Broadway ready for the parade. So even like at 7, 7.30 in the morning, you know, three and four hours before the parade starts, there's these chairs and people are getting their places ready. And the first time I saw that, I was like, this means something really special to these, these folks. We have hundreds of hours of volunteers that come in. We have an increasing number of sponsors each year. and. There's just this constant reminder that people think this is important, even though sometimes after you do it for a while, you might not think, do people still want this? Do they still want to engage in this? Is this, you know, is this a tired idea? And then they show us it's not. 
Lightworks started as an idea of how, once again, to get the community involved. Um, there are other communities around the country that do their own lights festivals, and I think that sort of spurred some ideas within the Parks Department. One of the things about Lightworks that's probably, um, you know, about people having their favorites, it, you know, it's not necessarily as much as a theme, but it is, you know, people have their favorite, um, you know, the kids really like the dinosaurs and somebody really likes the nativity scene. And, and my favorite is the, the archway, you know, the, the tunnel of lights. Uh, we've had a number of people um, propose in those lights. And so once again, it's another demonstration of how they think it's a special place. Um, we have a family here in town who actually was, you know, their father created that tunnel. And I know that they have had some special moments there with marriage proposals and with family. It's a real starting point for the holidays and so it's a much more intimate and personal kind of um, way to enjoy a festival because people are, you know, it's either in small groups or even by themselves where they're, they're going through this process and getting to engage in the holidays in their own way. We uh, live northwest of Lake Paradise, um, just off the old state road, and um, my family still actually lives out that way. I uh, grew up just south of my grandfather's farm and spent a lot of time on the farm. I started baling hay when I was five years old. We had, uh, we had chickens, we had uh, very few hogs, we had cattle, we had horses, we had 30 hives of bees. And we had an apiary. Well, besides the apiary, we had uh, we had fruit trees, all of the different things that, that, that basically truck farmers had back then. The city of Mattoon, uh, we we didn't get in very often when I was younger, um, mainly because rural life back then was very limited. We had very limited access to town, but whenever we would come to town, uh, I remember the different things that we would do and uh, see and smell. And it was just an experience for me as a young kid. And uh, we, when it was time to come up, pick up chickens, he knew they were, they were coming in on train and we would go to the depot and that's where the chickens came in and we would go pick up the chickens and take them back. Uh, one of our big treats, of course, was to come in when we go to the drive-in theater. We'd stop by Dog and Suds and get root beer and then drive out to drive-in theater and just sit and watch a movie. You stick your old speaker in the window and uh, turn it up and everybody just sit and enjoy the show. Actually, I went to St. Mary's and then St. Joe and then um, went to Central Junior High School and then on to Mattoon High School and then we moved to Charleston and I finished high school in Charleston. As far as I remember, rode the school bus. They were a little bit rough. Uh, we had a lot of farm to market roads back then. Uh, the roads weren't paved as good as they are today. My grandfather had bees, and if you understand bees, the drones are the male bee, they cannot sting, and, and I would collect those in the jar, and then I'd let those loose on the school bus. When Sally Ann Bakery first opened up, my dad was working there, and we would go pick my dad up, and uh, we'd sit outside and wait for him to get off, and it, the smell was absolutely incredible. Uh, I went to St. Mary's, and St. Mary's was just across the street was Bly's Donut Shop, and Ruth Bly was a good friend of my mom's, and uh, I would go over, walk over, and every day Ruth Bly would give me a small bag of donut holes. Well, actually, I ate them all. I, I, didn't, I didn't share with anyone else. Well, when I was in, uh, we went to St. Mary's School, of course, Back then, nuns were the teachers, and the convent was right next to the uh, to the school. Um, when the uh, Sound of Music came out in the middle '60s, I was about eight years old. I remember the nuns walking us from St. Mary School down to the theater, and we sat and watched the Sound of Music, and then they walked us back. And I will never forget that. That was it was actually a lot of fun. I would say more than anything, just the difference of, of being a country boy coming into a, a town and, and actually having something to do that was so much different than, than being out in the country. Because out in the country, we were very sheltered. 
from anything. We come into town, there'd be so much to do. There was so much activity going on and it just, it made it fun. Welcome back. We are having so much fun in the studio. We got the bell going and that's telling us that we need people to call and support this program. Speaking of people that have called and supported, I'd like to thank Brian. Hey, there's two Brians. That's cool. Two Brians, William and Barbara and Vernice. I love that, I love name. that name. Thank you so much to all of you. The bell is setting there. We want someone right now to call the number on the screen and support this great program. Jeff is going to ring that bell, but we're going to keep on talking until somebody calls. We need you to call tonight. Now, how many people have called in tonight? We have gotten 56 calls 56. tonight. 56. Okay, our last goal was 60. Mm -hmm. We want to meet 60, and we want to take it up to 75. <laughs> we're going to meet 60 and raise you 10. Well, absolutely. Is that like poker or something? Yeah, but I'm going to raise them 15. I think, mm -hmm. Matt Toon, you can support the storytellers from your city. You can do it. We have faith mm -hmm. in the people in our community. And... By, by calling this number at the bottom of your screen, you are going to get a historical video of only stories told by your friends, your neighbors, your family on two DVDs. Over two hours worth of footage of stories. And 32 stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is nowhere else you can get this. There is not a, a video documenting mm -hmm. all of these stories told from people. There we go. Their personal Jeff. stories they're passionate about. Mm -hmm except by calling the number at the bottom of your screen. Well, what's interesting, the people are calling and saying, wow, I want to support this program. It's bringing back so many memories. Mm -hmm. talk, talk about the lady that called about the Mad Gasser. Well, supposedly this lady lived a block and a half from the person who was accused mm -hmm. as the Mad Gasser. Mm -hmm. Now, that kind of creeps me <laughs> out, but, you know, it's stories like that that... Mm -hmm. And this she show said, is bringing back memories, memories. to people. And, and she loved watching it. And she also said that they live within a block. And the people were so nice. The, the people that were accused, the family, they were the nicest people. They did a lot for the community. So interesting yeah. story. Yeah. Thanks for calling in and sharing yeah. that story with us. Our storytellers have actually gotten callers mm -hmm. um, telling about memories like that that we have shared. I, Carolyn has um, talked about one just a few minutes mm -hmm. ago on the last break. So you know what? When you call in your pledge of support tonight, there we go. give us an idea of maybe a, a, a memory that you had from sure. one of these stories. I well, mean, we really want to hear from you. And when we talked to Andy and heard about his the country boy comes to mm -hmm. town, it was such a great story. And I know Andy personally, and I'm so glad that he was able to do a story and, and re remember mm -hmm. the good old days. Yeah. I mean, the smell of the bakery mm -hmm. and, and being on the bus mm -hmm. and you know, teasing girls. I mean, Andy's just a cool dude. <laughs> yeah, and he's here in the studio with us, and he was sitting over there watching his story for the first time tonight. Mm -hmm. And I just love that. I just want to get a picture of Andy, <laughs> you know, watching what WEIU has been able to do with him mm -hmm. and become a part of his life, and he's become a part of ours. And it's just those great connections that we are making in the city of Mattoon, and we want to continue making more of those, and we can only do that when you call tonight. Right, and you know, Mattoon to us, has become just an awesome community. I grew up in Charleston. Mm -hmm. I've been to Mattoon a lot, but I now want to go to Mattoon more. Mm -hmm. I want to go visit some of the store, some of the places that people have talked about. I want to go visit Dodge Cemetery. What a beautiful, beautiful story. Oh, talking about beautiful. The murals earlier mm -hmm. that oh, we sure. saw the story about, wow. I mean, and they're going to have another one coming up mm -hmm. soon. I mean, the city of Mattoon is beautiful. It wants to remember the history. It sure. wants to present it to people and to showcase it. And that's what we're doing tonight. And you can have a piece of that mm -hmm. by calling, becoming a member of WEIU, and call the number at the bottom of your screen right now. Well, it would be a shame if you missed this opportunity to support a program that's all about your community, the storytellers are from your community and they picked the stories. Mm -hmm. They chose the stories oh, yeah. that they wanted to talk about. We didn't come into Mattoon and say, do a story on A, B, or C. These people came to the town meeting mm -hmm. and said, we want to be involved. What do we have to do? And what stories can we do? And we said, it's your, it's your deal. You want to mm -hmm. do a story on something historical or something mm -hmm. like Andy? He was a country boy coming to town. Mm -hmm. Great, great story. Yeah, and that's why the show is titled mm -hmm. Matt Tune, This Is Our Story. And we're going to hear more from one of our stories teller, storytellers right now. Keep Over on calling. You, Lori. All right, thanks, ladies. I'm here with Carolyn Cloyd, who many of you probably know is the head of the uh, United Way. 
So they may be surprised to know that you are actually a military history buff or expert. <laughs> or just someone that likes it, I guess. So. Because yours yes. was a complicated story, but nonetheless very interesting, I think. And why did, why did you like that story? Well, I just do like military history. Um, my, father's, my father served in the military. I was a military brat before we settled in this area, so um, military history just interests me. And who would have, who would have thunk <laughs> that that was all happening in Mattoon? And Steve, what's just shouted out? What was that? That was the first organized military. Uh, first time in U.S. military history that uh, formal campaign of insurrection. Yeah, yeah. Took first time in U.S. military history, military insurrection. Now there is actually now a plaque designating that. Tell people where that is if they right. don't know. It is at um, 19th and Western mm -hmm. and um, it sits at the eastern edge of Wolf Park in Mattoon. There's one of the murals, the smaller mural, is on the side of the building and then it's at the eastern edge of that park and it, it's about the special ops, the Confederate okay. special ops. Now what there's a what was actually sitting there at one point in time in Mattoon's history? Well the Essex house was near there okay. and it's uh, thought that these um, gentlemen that came, the operatives, probably stayed at the yeah. Essex House. You, we've seen the, uh, uh, we used this photo of the Essex House. It was this hotel and all the tracks, north, south, east, and west, all intersected there. So can you imagine getting across those tracks now? Yes, <laughs> yes. So that there's that's actually a very historic part of Mattoon. So, you know, get out there, check out that, that plaque and Definitely. enjoy that little park there. It's a great place. So we want to thank you for being a storyteller. But now we got to turn it over to Jeff Owens, who has something special to share, right? Well, to my boys at the Mattoon Police Department, there you go. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Uh, they, they text me and said if I winked at the camera, they, they, they would uh, donate a pledge. I'm like, well, that's easy. That's, not, that's nothing solely stupid to do. Appreciate it. We appreciate all the work you do at the Mattoon Police Department. The Mattoon Fire Department was in our show tonight and so keep giving i think uh we're up to about 65 or 66 calls we can get to 75 if you call right now people in mattoon get on those calls and let's do it right now we want to get to 75 before this breaks over can't well i wonder if it'd work if i winked at anybody <laughs> <laughs> you just never know hey we are um having so much fun in the studio tonight uh when you call you get us so excited you just have to pick up the phone, call some of these operators right now that are standing by. We only have one person on the phone. We have, what, eight people who can take a phone call. So let's see if we can get all those phones busy tonight. What do you think? I think we can do it. I think you can do it. Now, I've got my brother standing by right here. He's giving me a look like, are you going to put me on air? But um, you know what, Shane? I'm really proud of you for being a part of the show tonight and representing uh, Matt Toon and being a part of the history. And tell me um, again why you chose um, to do the story with Bill. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, you and everybody here at WIU and uh, everybody for working on the show so hard. I know you guys put a lot of work into it. Um, it was a unique opportunity to really get to tell that story about stuff that I enjoy, uh, political history and whatnot, and actually meeting somebody who was uh, meeting a president uh, in a, one of the most historical campaigns we've had. And so I thought it was a very interesting story, and Bill did a great job. I was very proud of him uh, to, to do that. Yeah, I thought he did a great job, too. All of our stories did a wonderful job. So very happy with the program tonight. 32 wonderful stories about Matt Toon. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but here in the studio on the wall, we are also showcasing Matt Toon through some artwork um, that was brought to us by uh, Carl Clinic and a photographer from Matt Toon. So, you know what, any way we can, we wanna highlight Matt Toon tonight and say thank you. But you can say thank you as well to all the people who participated in this program by calling right now. Lori, over to you. All right, thanks, Kian. I'm back here with Andy Trueblood. We did a great story. Yours was, was really fun. Your story about letting the bees go on the on the bus and but one of the things you shared is you actually went to St. Mary's school and yes. give us one of your memories of being a St. Mary's uh, student. Well, I, one thing we had uh, I remember going in and doing the cake walks. Um, they, <laughs> cake walk. I remember that too. You no, know, I like cake. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> What can I say? So. And, um, you know, St. Mary's back in, in those days, it was nuns were the teacher. And yes, they you were. did share a very nice story in your story about them taking you to go see The Sound of Music, but what would they do if you didn't behave? Uh, 
The uh, stories about the rulers with the steel edges on the going across your knuckles is actually true. Uh -huh. um, I don't have arthritis yet, but maybe someday. <laughs> Did it hurt me? Um, it made me probably a better person. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, uh, I went to St. Mary, I went to St. Joe, which is now Broadway Christian Church. Yep. So um, I, I've attended uh, Lakeland College, uh, Central Junior High School, Mattoon High School. So I've hit pretty much most of the schools in Mattoon. Uh -huh. um, not because I spent too much time in school, <laughs> but it just, uh, Mattoon has been a really good place for me. It's, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun going up in Mattoon area. Yeah, we've just learned so much about Mattoon. We think it's a great town. If you're from there, I know you think it's a great town. And we want to thank everyone who's called in tonight and supported Mattoon and WEIU. Back to you, ladies. Okay. Thanks, Lori. Let's give a quick shout out to Sally, to Dick, Nancy, Harold, and Mike. And I have Beth, who is also a storyteller. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Beth. And I have Sandy, and Doris, and Nicole. Okay, right now we're at 65 mm -hmm. callers. That is phenomenal. We had no idea how many people were going to call tonight. But if we don't ask, you're not going to call. So right now, let's see if we can get 75. We need 10 people right now to get on the phone and look at the number and dial it up and support the station that made this program for you. And the storytellers that made it mm -hmm. important to document the history of Mattoon. It's public television stations like WEIU. We're your local television mm -hmm. station and we want you to show support by calling and talk to the storytellers and say thank you so much for telling that story and for representing Mattoon mm -hmm. and for documenting that history. We have eight operators standing by. They're going to be here through the stories. So don't don't sit there and just think, I can't call right now, because you can. You can call whether their stories are on or not. We're here in the studio. The number's at the bottom of your screen. So enjoy the program. Give us a call, and we'll see you soon.